So welcome everybody, uh, viewers and listeners, uh, to another episode of More Pin and Bra in Conversation. We're very happy to welcome you again to a very interesting topic this week. We're going to be talking about the Comintern. And uh, the first thing I'm going to ask Comrade Hopal to do is tell us what was the Comintern, a little bit about uh, why it was formed and, um, and what it represented. If you would permit me to give you some background to it, um, the, the Comintern was formed as a result of the collapse of the Second International. Uh, the Second International collapsed as soon as the First World War uh, started because the main social democratic parties, as they were called, Marxist parties in the Second International, deserted the principles of proletarian internationalism and joined their own bourgeoisie in the name of defense of the father, fatherland. I, so, I, just, I just wanted to clarify for those people who don't know what it means, what the international was. So there was the first international set up in the days of Marx and Engels in London to coordinate the parties across Europe, socialist parties. The second international came in the 1890s? 1889. 89, there you go, and um, coord was, was supposed to be a coordinating body of all of the socialist parties in the world. Uh, but as Rapal says, you know, tell us more, Rapal, what happened to that? So the Second International collapsed because the parties of the Second International, apart from the Bolsheviks and one or two other small parties, basically deserted to the side of their own bourgeoisie in the name of the defense of, of their fatherland. Now, what really is important is that once that happened and uh, the biggest party in the second international was the social democratic party of, of germany and when the war started on the 4th of august 1914 the social democratic members of parliament in germany voted for the war credits lenin could hardly believe the news when it, it took place it shocked him Absolutely. And of course, once it had taken place, an attitude had to be taken. And Lenin and the Bolshevik party were in the forefront of clearing the fog surrounding around the war. And a number of theoretical issues were cleared by the Bolsheviks, headed by Lenin. The first one was really the nature of the war. Now, the previous Congresses of the Second International especially the Copenhagen Con Congress in 1908 and the Baal Congress in 1912 had actually realized that a war was coming and quite clearly defined that the then coming war was going to be an imperialist war in which the workers of any kind of the, the warring parties will have no interest and it would be therefore their duty not to incite their workers to go around and slaughter each other but to fight, fight, fight against the war. But violating those solemn decisions and pledges given by the parties, almost everybody apart from the Bolsheviks and one or two of the small parties deserted to the position. So it fell to Lenin through his writings during this period and through the formation of a group uh, of, of left-wing people called the Z Zimmerwald Group. He cleared the position as to the question of war. First of all, he made it perfectly clear that the war that was being fought was an imperialist war. And the question is, what is one's attitude to war? We communists are not pacifists. We're not opposed to all war. And the Lenin's, Lenin's position was that war, following Clausewitz, and Lenin described him as the greatest hist historian of military history, uh, was a continuation of policy. It didn't just drop that suddenly one day the prime ministers and defense ministers of countries wake up and say, it'd be a good idea to have a war. This was a war that the major warring parties had been preparing for 10, 15 years. And to look at the nature of this war, you had to actually look at the policies they were pursu pursuing prior to the beginning of the war, during the war, and what they wanted to achieve during the war as a result of, of fi fighting that war. And looking at that, he came to the conclusion it was an imperialist war. It wasn't fought for the benefit of the people. It was a war. It was a predatory war fought for the redivision of the world 
and for spheres of influence. That's that's what it was all about. It was a fight between the German imperialism and, and, and its allies and fight between British and French imperialism and their allies as to how many slaves each one is to have, how many colonies each one is to have, what markets each one has to have. And therefore, Lenin's position was one had to divide wars into just wars and unjust wars. Just wars are, for example, wars of national liberation that in the 18th century and probably the beginning of 19th century were fought by the European bourgeoisie against the feudal rulers and against them against the monarchies. Or wars that are fought by oppressed people against their oppressors, national liberation movements against, against imperialism, or the, war, the most important and the most sacred of all wars, wars fought by the proletariat against the bourgeoisie for their own emancipation. These are just wars and we communists enthusiastically support them and will participate in them according to our, our uh, ability in each, each country. And this, this being the case, the communists were duty bound to fight against the First World War. And then Lenin's position was that in an imperialist war, instead of inciting the workers to go abroad and slaughter the class brethren, brethren from the other side, they should be fighting against their own bourgeoisie and they should turn this war into a civil war for the overthrow of cap capital. Then the other point that Lenin made was that why, why did the parties of, of the Second International deserted wholesale to the side of the bourgeoisie? And his answer was because of rampant opportunism that had been building, building up in these parties over a number of de de decades. These parties had become opportunists whereby they betrayed the long-term interests of the working class in favor of some short-term benefits that they could get. And the basis of this opportunism were the well-off sections of the working class and the, and, the, and the petty bourgeoisie who secured benefits under the conditions of imperialism. They received crumbs, if you like, from the table of imperialism and they were thoroughly corrupted. And therefore for them to be able to defend their privileges also involved the defense of imperialism. This happens right in front of us. If you look at the position of various parties in, 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 in America, in Britain, in France, etc., it's exactly the same, same thing happening. They cannot even tolerate these days even a mild form of left-wing policy as we saw in our own country in Britain, where Jeremy Corbyn was elected to be the leader of the Labour Party. And the bourgeoisie felt so threatened that they defeated him, not because he was a Bolshevik, not because he would have ushered in an era of proper socialism. It's just that it would have, he would have made mild reforms, which proved unacceptable to majority of the members of his own party. These are the representatives of opportunism. These are the representatives of labor aristocracy and the, and the petty, petty bourgeoisie. And it is because of that, that the, uh, the, the second international had become so thoroughly corrupt. So what happened on the outbreak of the war was not really a sudden event. It was not accidental. It was the culmination of a very, very long period of the saturation of these parties by opportunism. And therefore Lenin came to the conclusion the most important lesson to be drawn from that was to actually break with, with, with this opportunism, to break with the Second International, to form a new Third International. Although the Third International is not formed until 1919, actually the foundations of it were laid at the beginning of the war and these foundations were prepared for, most of all, by the Social Democratic Party of Russia and Lenin at its head, who galvanized as many people as he could, uh, including Re Rosa Luxemburg, including Karl, Karl Liebnik. To, to begin with, they were not consistent left, left wingers, but experience told them, unfortunately, too, too late for, for, for some of them, because as, you, as we'll discuss later, they, they were murdered. So really, 
that's what the first world war was that is what the background was that is what necessitated the formation of the third international so third international became known as the Comintern, the communist international right and it was under the leadership of the russian party because they had having followed the right policy that the rest of the second international jettisoned they were the ones who had then successfully made a revolution in the conditions of the first world war which none of the other parties did although the potential was there all across europe for just that revolutionary situation to occur so um caleb did you want to add to that before we move on a bit more to um the uh the significance of lenin's points for admission sure um I, i'll just add you know quickly the the u.s angle uh in the united states uh there were a number of socialists who've been elected to the the congress and such who sold out and supported the war um but eugene debs who was kind of the main voice of american socialism he stood firm and not only did he oppose the war but he gave an anti-war speech in canton ohio in violation of the law and was sent to federal prison uh for doing so um and the ruling class of the united states even though a lot of socialists had you know supported the war they used the war as an opportunity to smash the the, the workers movement uh, the Socialist Party was broken apart. Uh, their publications were banned from the mail. Um, and uh, the Industrial Workers of the World, which was kind of a revolutionary labor union, uh, was also broken apart by the government during World War I. Um, and it, it was an, an awful moment. Uh, there were uh, a number of socialists around the country who were killed uh, for opposing the First World War, including Frank Little. Uh, of Seattle, uh, who was a, a socialist organizer, and and he was they organized a, a lynching. Basically, he was lynched uh, by a mob. And uh, you know, it, it, back to Lenin. Uh, you know, you, you know Lenin. It's interesting. We have this image of Lenin that comes from you know films like October by Sergei Eisenstein, where we see him as this agitator who's who's out of, among the crowds giving speeches. But Lenin had a reputation as a very calm guy. Uh, he was very calm, very soft spoken. He liked to play the piano to kind of calm himself down. He got quite worked up sometimes over the disagreements in, in the Bolshevik party. But uh, if you read his writings on how the Second International collapsed and how all these supposedly Marxist parties sold out the workers and sent them off to die in World War I, uh, it's full of fire and rage at, at seeing what, what's happened. And I mean, it's 20 million working people sent to their deaths uh, just to help the imperialists carve up the world for themselves uh, and just to determine whether it would be the German and Austrian and Turkish imperialists who would, who would get one chunk of the world or the British and French and American imperialists who'd get another chunk of it. And and uh, Lenin said the opposite. He said that, you know, that, that workers should turn their guns around and make war against the war makers. Uh, and, and he had this revolutionary policy, uh, which ultimately in, in Russia, proved correct, right, and led to the establishment of a socialist society. So in the aftermath of that, it became necessary to form a new organization uh, of, of, of workers and revolutionary parties uh, that would have this correct line opposing imperialism. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we had a, a, a bit of a parallel here. There were, there were one or two brave and very committed socialist communists who stuck to the right line in Britain also. In particular, uh, well known is John McLean, who was in prison during the First World War for his anti-war activities. Um, but they weren't a strong current in the movement here. The Labour Party and the people who went along with the war were, were much louder. Um, Caleb, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the criteria that Lenin had for admission into the Comintern? Well, it was the 21 points is my general understanding. And it was essentially a lot of the breakthroughs the Bolsheviks had made about the concept of democratic centralism, the party of new type, uh, anti-imperialism. Um, I mean, it, it was kind of a new breakthrough. And it seems like following the Russian Revolution, uh, there were many uh, there were many people around the world that were attracted to the Bolsheviks uh, simply because they'd had a violent revolution. There were a lot of anarchistic and ultra leftist elements who said, oh, the Bolsheviks had violently seized power, so they must be good. Um, but they didn't really understand the the methods the Bolsheviks had used to, to build their organization, uh, the, the, the tactics they had adopted. And so the 21 points of admission you read them, it was really trying to apply these lessons to parties that would join and just you say you can't just join the Communist International because you like the idea of violence, you like the idea of a revolution. You have to actually understand 
uh, how we operate as an organization, the tactics. Uh, one very famous example um, is that the South African Communist Party, uh, when it was originally formed, it was a white supremacist party. It was a party of, of white settler, you know, labor union folks. And the Bolsheviks and the Comintern said, you can't join if you're a, uh, an organization like that. We don't we don't support racism. We don't support uh, uh, white settlerism and, and uh, white supremacism. So the South African, original South African Communist Party was rejected by the Comintern until a new party was formed that was you know, supporting the rights of black workers and white workers against the apartheid system. Um, and that it was the Bolsheviks kind of laying out their principles, what made Bolshevism and the revolutionary Marxism that had taken power in Russia separate from the uh, the ideology of the Second International and the, and the reformists. Kapal, I, I just I just want to add something before we come to the um, before I come to the twenty one points, and, and that is the immediate effect of the war was to flood to actually drown the revolutionary movement in a flood of chauvin, chauvin, chauvinism everywhere. You know, I mean, if Lenin had been found in Petersburg saying what he was saying in his uh, writings in Ill illegal activity, probably many of the well-meaning workers would have hanged him by, by, by the lamppost because that's the effect of war hysteria. We can see it now in our conditions. Everyone who is opposed to, the, to NATO's war against Russia today, you know, is asked to believe it's actually Russia that's waging a war against poor little Ukraine when Ukraine has nothing whatever to do with it. And who, whoever speaks the truth here, it reminds me of Plato saying, no one is hated more than a person who speaks the truth. And we find that to our, our, our cost at the moment, also to our honor that we can speak the truth and stand against, against this flood. So the initial reaction was a flood of chauvinism. But as the war, war progressed and casualties mounted on each side and people dying by tens of thousands every, every day in the trenches, particularly in the, in the Rus Russian army, it was such a backward imperialism. I mean, there were workers fighting at the front, didn't have food, didn't have boots. Three workers were sharing one gun. They didn't even have guns to, guns, guns to fight. So you can see why the revolution will break out in at its weakest link, link in, in Tsarist Russia. But the first revolt of the war was the Easter uprising in Ireland, mm. headed by, by Connolly. And if you would allow me, I'd like to read uh, one of Connolly's quotations. Uh, he said, well, Ireland could actually prove the link to a Europe-wide con conflagration. Because he said, starting from Ireland, A starting from Ireland may set the torch to a European conflagra conflagration that will not burn out until the last throne and the last capitalist bond debenture will be shriveled on the funeral pyre of the last war warlord. Now, Connolly, of course, uh, the Easter Rising of 1916 really is a forerunner of the October Revolution, uh, undoubtedly. Lenin's analysis was not available to Connolly, but it's to Connolly's honor and credit that he independently arrived at the conclusion that if the workers must die, they must die at home, fighting their oppressors and exploiters, rather than going out to foreign lands and shoot, and, and shoot their class brethren in a, in a war which only benefits the profits of their ruling class. Now, this was a fantastic uh, un un understanding. I mean, there are weaknesses in Con Connolly's position, but they don't concern us. But he was a thorough inter inter internationalist and he was a thorough revolutionary. And no, not surprising then after the rising, he was executed by the British Labour, Labour Party through, through, through Henderson. Ramsay MacDonald called, condemned him as a militarist. Everyone in the Labour so Social Democracy, i.e. the Labour Party, condemned Con Connolly, one of the, the, the greatest sons produced by the, by the British work working class. Now, now they sometimes try to turn him into an icon, but he's somebody who at the time was mur mur murdered, just as Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Nievelich were murdered 
by the Free Corps organized by the Social Democratic Party in, 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 in Germany. So that was the position of social democracy. And that is why Lenin's position was that a break must be made, 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 made with, with social democracy and a new communist international formed. His slogan was, second international is dead. Long live the third international, communist international. And it was really a full fulfillment of, of Engels' prediction. Uh, after the first international, first had been moved to the United States because anarchists were causing too much mis mischief in Europe. And then a couple of years later, it was dissolved because it just didn't work. And the decision was taken by, by Marx that the situation had changed. A lot of parties and groups that had joined the first international had matured. They could look after their own affairs. There was no need, if you like, for a party, single party of the of the international proletariat, which is what the first inter, inter, international international was. So uh, the, 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 this, this 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 was the, the, the was the position, and when therefore third international was formed, as Lenin says, we are so popular that communism is becoming almost fashionable. Difficult to believe now. Communism is becoming fashionable. And every opportunist wants to join with us because we are successful. And therefore, we must bar the door to them. We must lay down strict conditions, as Caleb has already pointed out. And those strict conditions, if I can emphasize, were, first of all, that whoever joins, whichever party joins the Communist International, must accept the dictatorship of the proletariat. No longer sufficient to accept parliamentarism, there had to be the acceptance of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And the message of proletarian dictatorship should be taken to the workers in the language they understand most so that they will come to realize what dictatorship proletariat stands for. Not just repeating the formula, but, re but actually explaining the essence of it. Secondly, opportunists of the Second International never paid any attention to the oppressed peoples. If the question, national question was ever raised, it applied to Ireland, it applied to Poland, it applied probably to one or two places in the Baltic, and that was the end of it. There was no mention of the hundreds of millions oppressed and exploited and colonized by the bourgeoisie of their own countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And therefore, one of the conditions for joining the Communist International was to accept that they will support the national liberation movements of all peoples oppressed and exploited by their own 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 own, own bourgeoisies, uh, be, be, because without that there could be no revolution. As Lenin pointed out again and again, and this is really a great contribution of Lenin's that the the struggle of the proletariat for its own emancipation would be a sham and a humbug, unless in this struggle they were joined with hundreds upon hundreds of millions of, of colonial slaves who were exploited by their, their own bourgeoisie. So it was very important to, to support them because the proletarian revolution has two sides. The proletariat and the imperialists and advanced countries fighting against their own bourgeoisie, but also supporting the national liberation movements. They constitute, if you like, two wings of the liberation movement. The victory of one strengthens the other. Proletarian revolution in the imperialist countries would have eventually straight away led to the freedom of the colonies, as indeed it happened in Tsarist Russia, which Lenin used to describe as a prison house of, of nations. And on the morrow of the revolution, all these people were told, you have the right of self-determination and you can exercise it. Some exercised and separated forever. Some exercised for a short period of time and returned to join, 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 join the Soviet Union. But what was important was this liberation was achieved not under the flag of nationalism, but under the flag, flag of proletarian internationalism. Not on the basis of enmity and hostility to, towards other nations, but on the basis of fraternal cooperation, solidarity and fr friendship between nations. Now that doesn't happen everywhere. It would not easily have happened in the case of Br Br Britain and India. But if Britain were to have a revolution, it would not be surprising if the Indian said, we want to keep our connection with Britain, but on a completely new equal, equal basis. Likewise, 
if India had achieved its freedom under a properly revolutionary democratic organization, it would have met, strengthened the British proletariat and other proletariats in the imperialist countries very well. So they, they, they spoke to each other. And because opportunism had been such a factor in the collapse of the international, one of the conditions, as Caleb would remember, of joining the Communist International was each of these parties must fight against opportunism. Fight against opportunism had to be at, at, at the forefront of the parties join, joining, the, joining the Communist International. This fight had to be conducted through control over by the party over parliamentary, parliamentary groups and the party publications and press. These are usually the ones that lead the way to all crop corruption. You know, you're a journalist. You, you flaunt your position as, as a journalist. You're a member of parliament. You flaunt your position as such. But these people must be subject to the control of the party. And any scoundrel who does not follow the party obviously must be expelled, expelled, expelled from, the, from, from the party. And then, of course, is the question of discipline in the parties. There must be democratic centralism. Each party joining the Communist International must practice democratic centralism, which means there is proper free discussion within the party to decide a policy. But once that is decided, everyone, including those who oppose that policy, is obliged to follow, follow that policy. That is the only basis on which, on strict iron discipline, can the party continue to be on, 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 revolution, on revolutionary line, lines. So these were some of the things that, that Lenin was. And of course, the decisions of the Communist International were binding on all parties, of the Congresses, as well as of the Executive Committee. The Communist International basically acted as the party of the proletariat of the entire world. So you had to accept the decision. Its, its decisions had to be publicized in the press and major organs of each constitu constituent party. So there are various other things, but basically they can be summed up in, in one sentence. They were designed to root out corruption and opportunism, strengthen the communist parties for the revolutionary struggle. Because revolutionary struggle cannot always be waged in conditions of leg legality, because bourgeois legality is a flimsy thing. When the bourgeoisie feels threatened, it puts an end to it. So the parties must learn to combine their legal activity with their illegal activity. So it, imposition of illegality on them does not put them out of business. They must be able to have somewhere print facilities to print leaflets, newspapers, etc., and carry on. And of course, one, one of the other important things of, the, of joining the Communist International was every party had to do its best to conduct propaganda in favor of proletarian revolution in the armed forces. A very difficult task. So the Bolsheviks achieved it. If they could achieve it, so could any, any, any anybody else. And in fact, it's difficult, really. I cannot believe any revolution anywhere has been successful without making inroads into, into the army. Army is the most disciplined detachment of the bourgeoisie. It has guns in its hands and it can impose its discipline if it acts as a single body. So the disintegration of the army and making inroads in, into it is very important. Not only has have the Bolsheviks done that, even regimes which are by no means progressive have done that. When the Khomeiniites came to power in Iran, they had made serious inroads into, into the Shah's army. And that is a viewpoint that every revolutionary must understand, that they must not regard police, the armed forces, etc., as no-go areas where they don't go. We got to take our propaganda, no matter how difficult it is, everywhere. I think I've taken a sufficient time. You remind us, Rapal, that Lenin described um, uh, soldiers in the army and in the police as workers in uniform. And that is the Leninist position. They are workers. They may be paid by the state to uphold the state machine, but so are many people in all kinds of jobs. Um, and absolutely, we want to convert as many of them as possible to the cause of the working class. So they'll bring their knowledge, their skills uh, and their understanding of the workings of the state to our side uh, to help us to win. Um, it's very interesting to look at the Comintern. You know, it was formed in 1919 
And if you if you look at the history of most of the countries around the world, actually it was the the successful carrying out of the October Revolution and then the formation of the Comintern, which was a spur for many countries to form communist parties, proper communist parties. Uh, some of them hadn't even known about Marxism until the communist revolution happened in Russia. I mean, certainly the Chinese, Mao Zedong talks about the fact that, you know, the October Revolution kind of burst in on them like and 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 kind of revolutionized everybody's thinking there who'd been thinking along kind of uh, standard nationalist lines suddenly a, a whole new vista opened up to them that marxism existed in the world uh, and we know that the chinese communist party was formed in uh, 1921 many communist parties were formed 1919 1920 1921 this was a the period where the prestige of the Bolsheviks having successfully carried out their revolution was so high, the prestige of socialism was so high uh, that you know all around the world people were people were ready to to join a party like that. Oh look, we can win if we have a party like the party Lenin has. And of course, the fantastic leadership and the theoretical understanding that had enabled the Bolsheviks to be successful in Russia was what enabled the Comintern to have the respect of workers all over the world. Um, but of course, they came up against you know various obstacles. It's interesting. Uh, Lenin wrote a warning against left-wing deviations in 1920, didn't he? Uh, Caleb, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know the book "Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder." Uh, I believe it's called a popular essay on tactics. It's, it's a very, very good book in the sense that it gives in very clear language a critique of some of the uh, ultra leftist methods that were used uh, by various parties. You know, you know, some of these these parties around the world uh, were refusing to run candidates in elections because you need a revolution. You don't need an election. Some of them were refusing to uh, join labor unions that were not communist led and saying, well, we're, we're only going to join communist unions. And if you read left wing communism and infantile disorder by Lenin, uh, he's really making clear that we should never put any unnecessary barricade between ourselves and our class. Uh, we should use every mechanism possible, whether it's running an election or or working inside of a, of a reformist trade union or use any possible method to to organize the working class. And one of the things that I've noticed is that um, that there's a lot of people that like half of the book. Um, a lot of the reformist elements, uh, the Communist Party USA in the United States and and others, they like the first half, you know, like, oh, go where the workers are. But they don't follow the second part, which is then teach them communism and win them to revolution. And they'll hold up this book to say, oh, this means you should vote for the Democrats. Oh, this means you should join the labor movement. But they're missing the point, as Lenin's saying, well, sometimes you might endorse one candidate or other. But the point is to to build a communist movement and 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 such. Uh, you might run in elections. Sure, you might do election work. But the point is to use the elections as a platform to win workers to communism. Sure, you might join the the existing labor movement, but you're working within it to to win people to communism. And they kind of miss the second half. They, they get the first part. And that also, I know in, in your country, a lot of people will point to Lenin saying that in the context of this anti-communist, uh, you know, hysteria, that it was necessary to endorse the Labor Party. But that was only because of the specific context of, of I believe it was uh, Lloyd George was, was whipping up an anti-communist hysteria, claiming the Labor Party was somehow working for the Soviet Union when they were virulently anti-communist. And so Lenin instructed uh, the communists of Britain, he said, support the Labour Party, but you'll be doing so in the same way that a rope supports a hanged man. So he wasn't telling them to to support the Labour Party and just be a faction within it and, and just be supporters of reformism. He said, in this specific context, do it, but you're doing it because you want to destroy the reformism. You want to destroy the reformist element. So you know, that book is, is paraded around by reformists, uh, but but if they actually look at the content, it's a very revolutionary text. And throughout it, he's saying, he's saying, use whatever tactic is necessary to spread revolutionary Marxist politics among the workers. Yeah, well, uh, can I? Please. Yeah, but it was, it was against the people who, uh, Caleb has just pointed out, who would not work in reactionary trade unions, that one of the, condition for admission to the Second International was that these parties will work in mass organizations of the working class, whether they're trade unions or, or some other associations, cooperative societies, they will go everywhere. That, that was clearly laid down. But Caleb is quite right. The opportunists accept that part 
of Lenin's statement. And in fact, left-wing communism became a Bible for every opportunist, you know, wherever you could find him from Europe to America to even a a a Asia. But it's not really, if you read the, as, this, as Lenin used to say, as Stalin, sorry, Stalin used to say, to take a part of Lenin is actually to go against Leninism. You got to have the whole thing in in front of you, and you got to take the whole body of 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 of, of his, his thinking. And if you look at left wing communism, the whole idea of fighting against the lefts in Germany who won't work in trade trade unions, or some of the syndicalists in Britain who who, who wouldn't, or who wouldn't participate in parliamentary elections, etc. Lenin is, is basically saying the purpose of going there is actually not to bolster, but to actually undermine parliamentarism. You go into parliament to undermine parliamentarism, to expose it as a bourgeois hoax, which can never, never lead to the deliver, deliver, deliverance of the working class. For that, a proletarian re revolution is, 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 is required. And uh, when the... Uh, after a very short period of time, when the communists decided to join the Labour Party, incidentally, the Labour Party never accepted their applications. They continued to do that year after year, decade after de decade, because the leadership of the Labour Party had read the proceedings and especially the conditions for admission to the Communist International more in a studied way than the Communist Party. They wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. And their, their excuse always was, you're not a local party. You're subject to control by, by foreigners in the Communist International. You can't, you, you can't join us. And there are basically dead organizations and dead people in this country. If not actually clinically, they are dead politically. Carry on still saying we should affiliate to the Labour Party. They carry on supporting the Labour Party, that is the party of the working class. The Lenin only said it's a party of the working class because workers are in this party. But he also went on to say the real physiognomy of a party is not determined by whether people come from the working class or not, but what the policy of the party and of its leadership is. And if you look at that, Lenin said, the Labour Party was a bourgeois Labour Party. You know, it wasn't a proletarian party. If we were going to go there, the idea was to expose liberalism, to actually go into the Labour Party and say, Henderson is a traitor. McDonald is a, is, a, is a traitor. Did they do that? No, they didn't. They just wanted to, to join, join the Labour Party. The question of treachery simply did not arise. So really, the purpose of joining is to uh, ex, 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 expose it um, as, as such. And the other condition for joining the international was unconditional support for the Soviet Union. At that time, there was only one Soviet Union. But when more socialist countries came, the idea was that the communists in countries where revolution hadn't come about, they must support the revolutionary governments which are ruled on so so Soviet principles. Unconditional support. And yet there are people in our country who actually rubbish the achievements of Soviet socialism and yet want to be called co communists. And you cannot call them com communists because they are not communists. They, they are not proud really of the greatest achievements of our class, even if the class happens to be in a, in a different country. Because the Bolshevik party, when it ruled Soviet Russia, it actually had turned Soviet Russia into a motherland of the workers of the of the workers of the whole, whole world and that is why thinking and intelligent workers not just communists actually admired the soviet union and rallied around to support it and that was the basis of workers refusing to load arms on a ship that was carrying armaments to throttle the bolshevik revolution at, at birth during the period of foreign intervention after after the october revolution and that is something that workers can understand if you explain to them it is in your class interest. It's not in your interest that you go and kill other workers and be killed by them for the sake of the profits of your own ruling class.
Thanks, Rapal. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Rapal, to just introduce us to the topic a little bit of um, the opposition uh, to the line of the common term. So, you know, as ever with the class struggle, there's opposition from the left, so say, and opposition from the right, so say. On the one hand, you have Trotskyists. On the other hand, you have Bakaranites who, and it's always noticeable to me that whether they're left opposition or right opposition to a communist line, um, they always end, seem to end up very happy to work together <laughs> against the so-called center, i.e., you know, the correct Marxist line uh, when it comes to trying to to get their way, as it were. So their their points of principle tend to disappear in the tactics of trying to sabotage, uh, you know, the the line being taken that they don't like. But Hapal, do you want to talk to us a bit about those oppositions? Well. As far as I, I'm aware, there was no opposition to either the formation of the Communist International or to the 21 conditions for admission. The differences really arose much uh, soon after that on a whole host of, of, of questions. The first big dispute between Lenin and his supporters and the opposition was on the question of the Brest-Litovsk Treaty. I, as the war was proceeding, Soviet Russia had proposed the cessation of hostilities and that all warring parties should stop fighting and agree on a democratic peace on the basis of non-annexation. Well, since they were fighting for annexation, since they were fighting for colonies and grabbing from each other the maximum uh, portion of the, of, of the globe, they were not going to sign that. So, Russian army was totally exhausted. It was, you know, unable to fight. And Lenin therefore said, to, to, to actually save our revolution, we Russians, Russian communists, have to sign a separate peace with Germany. So that's what, what they did. And the negotiations for that took place in a town called Brest-Litovsk. Trotsky was the representative of the Soviet government. He'd been instructed to sign a treaty with the Germans. He violated that mandate and he went there. You know, Trotsky was a poser, um, uh, 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 our own spy, Robert, Robert Bruce Lockhart said, I got the impression that Mr. Trotsky would die fighting for Russia if there was a large enough audience. So he went, he, he went to this conference and the general, the, the German generals are sitting. He gives them a lecture about proletarian revolution. And then at the end of it says, we're going to demobilize, but we're not signing. Neither peace nor war. Well, German imperialism took the hint and they swept into vast territories which were not agreed to be given to them as a concession. They took more territories, including Ukraine, which is the subject of our... Uh, um, concerns the, in, the, in the, these days. And in the end, the treaty had to be signed because the Germans probably would have succeeded in overthrowing the Soviet government. So the agreement was signed. That was a major thing. And the so-called left socialists, headed by Bukharin, um, Radek, uh, and a, a few others jo jo joined this. And it was only by a very fierce struggle that Lenin was able to persuade the Bolshevik Central Committee to sign this, this, this agreement. So that was the first agreement. Soon after that, differences arose, as Caleb would remember and you would remember, Jyoti, on the question of the role of trade unions in Soviet Russia. And there are two articles I would suggest you make a study of it. Len Lenin's articles. One is trade unions and the mistakes of Co Comrade Trotsky and Comrade Bukharin. And another one, more on the mistakes of Comrade Trotsky and, and Comrade Bukharin where actually Trotsky wanted to make the trade unions an arm of Soviet government and basically militarize them and subject them to, 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 to military control. This he tried to do in the Transport work Workers Union. Lenin said, yes, we are a Soviet government. We are a working people's government, but all the same working people have their interests which have to be safeguarded by, by, the, by the trade unions. We must persuade them to work with, with us. We must persuade them to work with us, but we cannot institute military discipline uh, 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 over them. We cannot run them on military lines. So that was one. And then 
there are a whole host of differences on the question of the Chinese revolution, um, on the question of uh, the, the revolution in, in Germany, but they all flow from the fact that Trotsky had a theory, notorious theory called the, the theory of permanent revolution, which simply boiled down to this, that revolution in a backward country like Russia cannot succeed on it unless it's followed by a, a revolution in all the principal imperialist countries. Failing that, it's bound to fail. Even in his book, which we referred to last time, Caleb referred to, I referred to, uh, Revolution Betrayed, having paid tremendous tributes to Soviet construction, you know, even going to the extent of that the validity of Marxism is being proved not in the pages of Das Kapital, not in the language of dialectics, but in the statistics of production of steel, cement, electricity, etc. Then he goes on to say, but this revolution cannot succeed because it's not followed, unless it's followed by revolution in Germany and a number of imperialist countries, it will fail. And then goes on to denounce the fact that because it's working for socialism in one country, the Soviet Communist Party had degenerated. It had become bureaucratic. And you know his thesis in his life was that the Russian proletariat had been disenfranchised by the Bolshevik party. And the Bolshevik party had been dis disenfranchised by Stalin, right? That was the thesis to which he stuck all his life. And that was the basis of all the misfortunes that followed him on every single question. History and practice proved that he was wrong on every single uh, uh, question. A sensible person would say, I'm wrong. It's time to change line or follow Einstein's saying to actually repeat the same activity and expect different results is the definition of insanity. But Trotsky was basically insane and he had no faith in the ability of the Russian working class in leading the Russian peasantry to build socialism in so Soviet Russia. And this led him to that. Bukharin, on the other hand, to begin with, was a rightist. He didn't believe in collectivization. He said, well, no, no, leave the Kuluks alone. Let them get rich. And slowly but surely, we'll all mer merge into socialism. His policy was defeat defeated as well by collectivization and industrialization. He didn't want the tempo of the industrialization to be as fast as it was because it was imposing too many burdens. Undoubtedly, the tempo was imposing burdens on the Soviet people. But they accepted that tempo and the burden along with it with actually real enthusiasm. No country building socialism has had such experience of mass enthusiasm as the carrying out of the Soviet five-year plans, first five-year, second five-year, third five-year, fourth five-year plan. Tremendous amount of enthusiasm because they were building a future for them themselves and for their children and for, and, and for their grandchildren. And that was precisely shown, which perhaps one day we can discuss, in the, in the se Second World War, where actually people went to the war in such large numbers to defend what they had, had, had built. If the Soviet regime had degenerated, if it was bureaucratic, there's no way it would not have been overthrown during the Second World War. And during the Second World War, Trotsky was saying, Russia cannot win. You know, I mean, he died before the Soviet Union was, was, was invaded. He said, if the war should remain a war and revolution doesn't spread elsewhere, then to a frankly posed question, we must give a frank answer. Russia will not be able to withstand. It will be defeated. But that will be the time for the revolutionary proletarian party, i.e. Trotsky and his half a dozen followers, to take control of the reins and actually spread the revolution everywhere. And so really these differences were on every single question. Trotsky was wrong. And when the Bukharanites were defeated and Kamenev and, and Zeno, Zenovia became defeatists that so socialism could not be built, they all joined their forces. And Stalin said, well, they've joined their forces. But if you add zero to a zero, it does not make a sum. It won't make any difference because they are discredited. And when the vote was taken after a long discussion, which discussion should have never taken place. It was in violation of the decision resolution of the 10th Party Congress, which was put forward by which forbade 
the formation of factions on separate platforms. But they had a platform. One was a platform of 43, another one a platform of 84. So there are two platforms. When the vote was taken, the opposition, led by Trotsky, had 4,000 votes. And the party had three quarters of a million votes. Now you judge for yourself who is more popular, popular the party or the Trotskyites. They were beaten. And therefore, the resolution of the party to build socialism, of the 14th party conference and the party congress to build socialism were carried out and with great vigor, valor, and heroism. And the world has never known such construction. And anybody who is a serious student of history of Soviet Russia, even if he's a bourgeois and his brain is not locked up, he is able to admire the colossal achievements of the Soviet Union during that period. And so these were the fights that had to be waged. But all the accusations that Trotsky was later and the abuse that he was to hurl at Stalin, he had during 13, 14 years from 1903 to almost July 1917 hurled against Lenin. Such wonderful things as, you know, the Lenin's whole platform is built on lies and falsifications and bears within itself the seeds of its own destruction, you know. That Lenin, this evil-minded person, must be removed from influence if the Soviet proletariat is to be saved. And these are the sort of things that Lenin, of course, answered in kind. He constantly talks with Judas Trotsky. He talks of him as a, as a diplomat. He's somebody who's never understood a single question of Marx, Marx's theory. He doesn't under, understand uh, understand Marxism. He's a poser and a, and a, and a dilettante. And yet we were asked to believe that after the death of Lenin, there was only one person who actually could take the position of the general general secretary, it and and it should not have been Stalin. But in fact, when the question came for discussion in the Soviet Communist Party, the, the Central Committee as well as the Congress, Stalin offered to resign in response to some comments made by by Lenin in the so-called testament, which was not a testament, some odd remarks made and written by his, his, his secretary. He resigned. Everybody said, you can't resign, including Trotsky voted for him to carry on in, the, in, 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 that, in that position. And so later on, they uh, give the party apology for their mistakes and they promised not to do the same and violate it again. It carried on until the May Day demonstrations of, of 1927, when they actually organized demonstrations in opposition to the usual May Day demonstrations organized by the party against that. And all kinds of hostile elements joined them in the streets because they saw their chance. That if they're fighting against the building of socialism in the Soviet Union, it doesn't matter they call themselves communists. They are to, on our side. We're bourgeois. We're also against building of socialism. So they joined them. If you read um, Deutsch's biography of, of, of Stalin, he makes it clear that when Trotsky was in the streets with these uh, demonstrators, he must have felt very, very funny that what the hell is happening because all the supporters he could find were out and out bourgeois who were opposed to socialism in any, 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 any case. And so in the end, he was expelled from the party. And when he carried on his activity from, from his exile within the Soviet Union in a place in which is in Kazakhstan, Alma-Ata, it's, 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 it's now called Alma, Almaty. And he was expelled from the Soviet Union. Then various wandering through various countries, he ended up in a place called Koyakon, which is a suburb, suburb of Mexico. I visited it just for the sake of prurience. I wanted to see where this counter-revolutionary end, ended up. And I saw the desk where one of his own supporters came with an alpine pickaxe and basically attacked him and, and he died, 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 died from those wounds. This is pinned on Stalin. Stalin had absolutely nothing to do with it. The guy who killed Trotsky was offered by the FBI a free pass that he'd be freed and he wouldn't be jailed, etc. If he said Stalin had sent him, he said, no, Stalin hadn't sent me. I had grudges against Trotsky. He's a poser. He's using everyone around him for his own selfish ends. He's got nothing to do with revolution. Well, I feel like we just had a whole section we should cut out and label as a discussion on Trotskyism. <laughs> uh, 
Thanks for that, Dad. I did interrupt you because it's all really interesting, but I, I'm slightly worried about Caleb's time and the fact that we're here to talk about the common turn. <laughs> so, um, Caleb, did you want to talk about at all about those questions of the opposition in the common turn? Well, I just, um, I again, I just want to bring the U.S. angle, um, which is well. First of all, I want to point out that Trotskyism is very well alive. You know, the bourgeoisie will roll out Trotskyites um, as a way of, you know, trying to give people a, a pseudo revolutionary message that stands in opposition to anti-imperialist countries around the world and countries that are building socialism. But Bukharanism has kind of just been erased from history. It's not that important. Um, and it's it's very important, actually. But the reason that the Bukharanite opposition uh, doesn't uh, doesn't get celebrated by the bourgeoisie and promoted the same way is because it doesn't have the same kind of romantic appeal. Um, the Bukharanites in the United States uh, were led by Jay Lovestone. Uh, and Jay Lovestone was a, a labor leader in the United States who was associated with the, the Communist Party. Um, and essentially, uh, he came to the conclusion that uh, that the common turn and their analysis uh, that social democracy was was the main opponent that you needed to expose opportunism. He said, well, that might be true for the rest of the world, but it doesn't apply to the United States. And so uh, his faction was expelled from the Communist Party. And the the term used uh, you know, to describe their deviation, uh, the American Bukharanites, was American exceptionalism which is a term that is now a phrase that is now considered like very standard in politics. Barack Obama was attacked because he wasn't an American exceptionalist. And and it's now part of the discourse in the United States that they've taken this term from Stalin and and applied it to, uh, you know, in the United States, you must be an American exceptionalist, like it's a good thing. And it's a term actually invented by, by Stalin to describe the Bukharanite opposition in the United States. The other thing that I, I find to be amusing is that, uh, you know, the leader of the Trotskyite opposition in the United States was a guy named James Cannon, uh, who's considered the father of American Trotskyism. Uh, and he was, you know, he he operated in secret after the Communist Party made clear that they they rejected Trotskyism. He organized kind of a secret faction within the party to promote Trotskyism. Uh, eventually they were discovered and he and Max Schachtman uh, and a few others uh, were expelled from from the Communist Party. And they were given a trial, you know, a public trial about, you know, the charge that they'd been organizing this underground Trotskyite faction within the Communist Party USA. Um, and one of the people who testified against James Cannon was the uh, the the public the, the head of the publishing house of the Communist Party, the head of international publishers. And when he was testifying against James Cannon for forming the secret faction, they said, you know, what evidence do you have against him? You know, has he bought books on Trotsky? Is he promoting books on Trotsky? He said, well, no, but he's bought every book we have on China. And everyone knows that China is a Trotskyite subject. And that was true because China was the main difference that the Trotskyite opposition had uh, with the Communist International. They argued that that the Bolsheviks making a strategic and then the Communists making a strategic alliance uh, with Dr. Sun Yat-sen and the KMT uh, was somehow a betrayal. When in reality, that was one of the most brilliant decisions uh, that the Communist International made. It was it was entering a strategic alliance with the KMT Nationalist Party and Dr. Sun Yat-sen's movement that allowed the Chinese Communist Party to expand to become a party of millions. And they hail what they call the first united front. Uh, you know, up to this day, the Chinese Communist Party says that was one of the most important things that they did. The fact that they could join Dr. Sun Yat-sen's Chinese nationalist movement and argue that if you really wanted to bring about democracy, independence and the people's livelihood, you should be a communist. And, and that building up a, a communist faction within this wider Chinese nationalist movement was strategically very brilliant on the part of, of the Chinese communists. And the fact that Trotsky was arguing that the Chinese Communist Party should be isolated uh, and should be attacking the KMT uh, and, and should instead be trying to build some kind of independent uh, ultra leftist uh, labor movement among the very small Chinese industrial working class at the time uh, was, was not strategic. Uh, and that Trotsky was consistently wrong on China. Uh, he was wrong on, you know, the question of, of aligning with the KMT. He was wrong on the eventual formation of the People's Liberation Army. He dismissed the peasantry of China as a class without a future that couldn't have a revolutionary potential, even though it was Mao organizing the peasantry in alliance with the proletariat that made the revolution. And China was the primary uh, difference that Trotsky had with the Comintern. And it was the area in which he's wrong. And I will add that a lot of people, it's it's just ridiculous historical fiction. 
A lot of people have in their heads that Trotsky believed in democracy and Stalin was the brutal dictator, you know, an authoritarian. This has nothing to do with the fight at all. It was not about that. It was the question of permanent revolution uh, and this ultra leftist uh, petty bourgeois fantasy that we're going to have a global armed struggle to behead every last king and capitalists, you know, and, and then if the Soviet Union dares sign a treaty or have, you know, relations with Western countries that's selling out the workers or something, it was this ultra leftist you know, bloodthirsty fantasy of permanent revolution that Trotsky held on to versus the very pragmatic and rational policies uh, of the Soviet government in recognizing that if we're going to build socialism uh, in one country, it's going to require us to to do so strategically and, and have five year economic plans and such. So I guess that's how I wanted to touch on that quickly. Uh, yeah. I, if I can I, I add to that, the Trotskyites and Bukharin as well. Uh, were at daggers drawn with the with the uh, and communists in Zinovia, were at daggers drawn with the Communist Party of the Soviet Union on the question 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 of of China. None of them could explain the nature of the Chinese Revolution. What exactly what was it? Instead of saying that it was an anti-feudal and an anti-imperialist str struggle, Trotsky said it was a struggle for. Uh, control of customs unions, you know, because imperialists had control of customs uh, in, in, in various various uh, uh, centers of population on, 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 the, on, the, on the seashore. They couldn't explain it. And they didn't pay any, any regard, as, as Caleb has said, to, to, to the peasantry. Millions of peasants were organized and they were fighting with gun, gun, gun in their hands. And Stalin said, you ask them, well, if there is no revolution going on, where is this struggle taking place? And he said, one gets the impression that these are really people who are revolutionary tourists who happen to be around, uh, uh, about, uh, around Leningrad. And they heard that the session of the Communist International was taking place. And they decided to bombard with a plethora, plethora of theses, which have absolutely nothing to do with the revolution in China. If you want to actually know what the Chinese think, there's a lovely pamphlet, uh, which is not seen by many people, by Chen Pota, who was very close until about just the very end of Mao's life to Mao Zedong. It's called Stalin, Stalin and the Chinese Revolution. And he says that the Chinese Revolution was successful because it basically followed the line given by the, by the Comintern. I, the working class had to lead the struggle of the peasantry in the anti-feudal and anti-imperialist struggle. These were the two main constituent parts of the revolutionary struggle in China, and the Communist Party must, 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 must fulfill it. The Trotskyites were exactly doing the same thing in, in, in Germany. Every time there's a disaster, every movement faces a disaster sometimes, not because the policy is wrong, but because the balance of forces does not fa fa favor it. So when Comintang turned on the communists and slaughtered a lot of communists and 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 and, and people who were supportive of communist trade unionists etc then the trotskyites found this was a good occasion to attack the policy of of, of the Comintern. so it carries on it goes through various things the the first um then for a few months six or eight months there's a left-wing Comintern which established its headquarters in a place called wuhan and so the question was, should you support Wuhan? On the one hand, Trotsky and Zinoviev say, yes, so we must support the Wuhan. On the other hand, they are pressing for Soviets to be organized in the Wuhan area. Now, Soviets are organs of uprising to overthrow a government. You cannot be part of a government which you are trying to overthrow at, at, at the same time. So really had no clue as to what was to take place. The Chinese revolution succeeded precisely because it followed the correct line which was the line of the Communist International, which was also the line line of Stalin. They actually pay backhanded compliments. The Stalin, this evil man, is sitting in the Kremlin and he can just turn on and off any revolutionary activity. He can control everybody. He writes everybody's pro programs. If anything good happens, it's got nothing to do with him. If anything bad happens, it's all 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 to do, do with him and the Comintern, etc. They they, 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 they they carry on that like that. It's exactly the same. Later on, the communist after the October Revolution, we go through various periods. 
the period of the October Revolution is a period of re revolutionary upheaval. We call it the, f the first pe pe period. Then, about three years later, by 22, 23, capitalism, apart from Russia, has more or less stabilized itself. And the Comintern itself, even during the time of Lenin, adopted a completely different attitude, even actually proposed that there should be a united front of working class organizations, including social democratic organizations, to fight against the onslaughts of capitalism. Of course, the social democrats never accepted that inv invitation. It's not for want of trying. Then that period gives way to what is known as the third period, when mm. revolutionary activity is revived. The sixth Congress of the Communist International actually gives an analysis that the, stable, the relative stabilization of capitalism, to which all the social democrats were singing praises, the American exceptionalism came, trade unionists of social democratic persuasion were visiting America and coming back with message from this new Jerusalem. There was no need for Marx. All we needed was now Ford, Ford, not, not, not Karl Marx. Karl Marx was out of date. Class struggle was out of date. Within the conditions of capitalism, you can improve your conditions. Comintern was saying, no, this relative stabilization is coming to an end and we're entering a period, period of up, upheavals. President Hoover was giving a message in America, giving lady dreams of endless prosperity coming. coming. And then within a few months, the crisis of 1929 broke, you know, like the falling of a house about one, 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 one years. And the communist analysis proved, proved, proved to be correct. There were 40 million unemployed in, in the imperialist countries, 11 million of them in the United States, two and a half million in, in, in Britain, five million in Germany, and so on and so forth. The Soviet Union by 1931-32 had abolished unemployment and its economy was proceeding at tremendous speed. We discussed this last time, so there's no need for us to go into it. The so Soviet Union was an inspiration to the whole world when everywhere there was desolation. Workers were standing in queues, dull queues, or trying to find a job and they did, they did not know what, what, the, what the morning will, will, will bring for them, where the Soviet working class was full of enthusiasm and hope and building a new, new, new society, building new towns, building new industrial enterprises, building new educational institutions, strengthening its army and defense capability. All this was take, take, taking place. And of course, uh, the, the Trotskyites blame the, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and Stalin particularly for the victory of fascism in Germany. Because they say this line of describing them as social fascists was the one that prevented unity between the communists and, and the social democrats and that therefore gave uh, encouragement for, well, that gave support to, to, the, to the Nazi party. The fact of the matter is throughout that period the Social Democrats never wanted to cooperate with the Communists. These are the people who have murdered Luxembourg and Karl Liebknecht, who drowned the workers in blood during May Day demonstrations, who actually do not want to support any work working class activity. And even when the Nazis come to power, they want to be a legal and respectful opposition, except that the Hitlerites did not appreciate it much. The, the head of the labor, the labor organization, Dr. Dr. Lay, said, no, you belong in the jail. You don't belong in the parliament. They were all bundled all the same to, to various dungeons. And even during the war, the Social Democrats actually were wanting not the victory of the Soviet Union. They said it would be terrible if either Germany or Soviet Union won to bring the victory of, uh, of Anglo-American democracy it was necessary that none of these should, should win. That is the re record of social democracy. They are actually social fascists. And they may not look like it. You know, you meet some of them, quite pleasant people. But if you look at their policy, it's poisonous to the interests of the working class. Okay. So, um, Harpal, um, the Comintern had its sixth World Congress in 1928. And the focus there was very much on the social democrats and how they were really the main roadblock to revolution. So, um, do you want to tell us a little bit what that was all about? But but they were they were they were disarming the the working class 
Um, Germany was the country where outside of the S S Soviet Union, and if you exclude ch exclude China for the moment, um, this was the strongest strongest communist party. It had recovered from the hammer blows delivered earlier um, with the help of social democrats by the by the by the bourgeoisie, and it 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 was a threat to be to be taken seriously. So every effort was made by the social democrats to rubbish the communist party. And there were people in 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 the in in the in the Communist Party. They eventually ended up by becoming lecturers in American universities, etc. Uh, you know, uh, Ruth. What was uh, Ruth's name? Uh, Caleb. Ru Ruth. Charles Ruthenberg. No, the, the, the oh, lady. Ruth Fisher. Ruth Fisher. The Ruth Trotsky. Fisher. Ruth yeah. Fisher. Uh, yeah. uh, and 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 one one or two others. They they were they were expelled from from by by, by the. But by the uh, coming turn, and du during this period, while the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was um, pushing forward the line that the uh, that the Communist International ex accepted, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was always accused of pursuing its national self-interest, and at the cost of world re re revolution. And as Stalin said. What is the world revolution if if the Soviet Union was to, to be to, to be destroyed today? It's the base of world revolution. It provides every facility for the growth of the of the, of the communist parties and the communist movement all all over the world. And he said in his famous phrase, "If God forbid, the Soviet Union was to be destroyed by the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie will seize the working class of every country by the throat." Well, we've seen the results since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. What exactly has happened? Everybody, including the American and British working class, have suffered as a result of it. Uh, wages in America and Britain have been stagnating for two decades. The only reason that the workers haven't felt is the stock market more or less has been doing well, and people go and are able to borrow money on the basis of the houses they live in. Until, of course, as a result of something like the subprime mortgage crisis, they start losing, lo losing, losing their houses. And secondly, they're basically sub subsidized by very cheap imports from countries like China. So what they lose in the way of not getting higher wages, they gain by cheap imports from China. So they get the benefits of that. And yet you have the leadership of trade unions in America, which blames everything in America on China. They say, well, you know, our industry is suffering because the Chinese are gutting our industry. It's not China that's gutting our, in, our industry. Long before China was on the scene, Lenin pointed out in his memorable pamphlet, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, one of the chief characteristics of imperialism, monopoly capitalism, is the export of capital as opposed to export of goods. Export of capital or not, you take a trunk full of dollars to, to China. No, you export production facilities there. It's the American capitalists who have taken their production facilities there because they can make more money by exploiting cheap Chinese labor and importing the same stuff to America. So they're making, make, making lots of money. This, so people who want to relocate industry in America, if they really think about it, they should join us because they're fighting against imperialism. Imperialism cannot really co-locate industry because the monopoly capitalism only went abroad because national boundaries were too limited for its for the growth of capital. So they've gone abroad. In fact, the Chinese market, even according to bourgeois uh, uh, economic serious economic analysts, has become too big for the world. China is a workshop too big for the world. The world is saturated with everything. Capitalism cannot solve this crisis, only socialism can through, 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 through planned production. So the Soviet Union was not following a nationalist line, it was following a line which will preserve the Soviet revolution while extending the revolution to other countries. And it gave help to every revolutionary movement from the Spanish Civil War to the Chinese, Chinese Revolution in, 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 in a big way. Of course, all that help was blocked by the imperialist governments in, you know, who prevented the Spanish, for example, uh, democratic government from getting arms. 
uh, they followed the policy of neutrality, which means help, help, helping Franco. And all that was done in every single country. So the Communist International was quite right in 28 to say Social Democrats were the main enemy. But once the fascists had come to power in Germany in 1933, the Soviet policy and the Comintern's policy changed, which was reflected in the seventh Congress of the Comintern, which took place in 1935, where the idea was put forward of building a united alliance of the, work, work, of the working class parties, including the Social Democrats, to fight against fascism. Did they get any help from the Social Democrats? No, the Social Democrats said, we'd rather have fascism. They didn't say that we'd rather have fascism. They, they, their excuse is always, Mr. Hitler has come to power through proper legal means and we shall be the law-abiding op opposition, opposition to Hitler. And they just would not even when Hitler had actually put their leaders in, 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 in jail, when he was slaughtering communists, trade unionists, Jews, minorities like, like Ro Ro Roma people, etc., when he was slaughtering, they would still not, not, not cooperate. That was the basic position. And that was the basic position of imperialist countries as well, including Churchill, who is considered to be the great fighter against fasc fascism. Churchill was very much in favor of Mussolini and, 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 and Hitler because they were the bulwarks against communism. Churchill had devoted all his life to actually fighting against communism and bringing the downfall of the Soviet Union. He was an arch reactionary. Belatedly, he realized that Hitler posed a threat not only to the Soviet Union, but to the British Empire, which was close to his heart. And that's why towards the end, he wanted an alliance with Soviet Russia. That's why he turned, quotation marks, anti-fascist. He's not an anti-fascist because even during the war, he continued his dirty dealings with a view to actually stopping that fight and pushing the German armies towards the east and perhaps even joining with them in bringing the down, down, downfall of the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union actually had a very, very intelligent policy. We shall one day come, come, come to it. And people who say, I mean, Deutscher is right. Trotsky, whatever policy the, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and Stalin followed, Trotsky was bound to follow the opposite. You know, so if they have an alliance with the want an alliance with the Social Democrats, they're selling the revolution. If they don't want it, they're splitting the working class movement and bringing fascist, fascism into power. So they, they could never win because when you are in the opposition shouting slogans, you have the liberty to do that. But when you're running a state and you have the actual responsibility of safeguarding its interests, then it's a very serious matter. You cannot dispense, uh, dispense with that job by simply flaunting phrases. So, um, Caleb, do you want to talk a little bit then about, you know, the Sixth World Congress, 28, uh, and the focus on social democracy as the main impediment uh, to a revolutionary movement, and then the change to the United Front Against Fascism in 1935 and what those represented? Sure. Well, um, you know, the term that I, the tactical shift was given, uh, they used the term united front from below, meaning that they understood the Social Democrats were hostile to communism, were hostile to the Soviet Union and to revolutionary organizing. But the idea was to try and build a united front with the working class people who might be influenced by these social democratic organizations by building a united front from below. And this was the period in which the Communist Party of the United States did some of their most revolutionary activism, building the unemployment councils, uh, you know, building independent labor unions. They were banned from the American Federation of Labor. Um, and so they, they, you know, they've organized, you know, the Trade Union Unity League and led some amazing strikes. And the idea was, OK, if the Social Democrats are going to lock us out by building economic fight back organizations, uh, we can we can build a united front with the workers uh, from below. Um, because the ability to form a united front from above, where you sit down with the Social Democrats and come to an agreement, uh, has been blocked. So we'll build a united front from below. And um, that tactic, I think, is much more um, much more honest in in a way because it's it's understanding. You know, there there is the illusion on the part of some communist leaders that somehow the Social Democrats, you know, sure they might be enemies, but at some point they're just going to have to sign a deal with the communists and be our friends, and that is. Not the case. I mean, these people are fundamentally opposed to 
what communists and anti-imperialists and revolutionaries are about. Um, so, you know, yes, there may be situations where you're able to form like a united front against fascism or something, but you have to be real about what you're dealing with. Um, and, uh, you know, and, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, I've tried to popularize the slogan out of the movement to the masses, meaning we need to get to the masses and the idea that we're going to get to the masses through building the movement dominated by social Democrats and by reformists and by agents of imperialism, uh, that's a delusion, right? It's never going to happen that way. We're not going to be able in the United States to get the DSA leaders to let us be part of their outreach to build a quote unquote socialist wing of the Democratic Party. We need to get to the masses ourselves. You know, this tactic of the united front from below, which I think there's a lot that can be learned from. Absolutely. And um it's really interesting, isn't it? Because we find in Britain as well that that period, the 1930s, was really the period when the Communist Party here had the most prestige, had the best, most consistent program, was doing some fantastic work. And you look at the, the conditions were uh, in, in many ways similar to today. You know, there's a uh, imperialist, again, kind of drive to war. There's imperialist economic crisis. The working class conditions were getting worse and worse and worse. Um, the difference was that the working class had revolutionary leadership at home and internationally, and they had a successful Soviet Union to look to that was making huge strides by implementing a socialist program. So the prestige of socialism and the ability of socialism, the ability of communist parties to reach the working class was massively expanded, even as relatively small parts of the working class movement, what they said had great weight and could be shown to be true in practice by what was going on in the Soviet Union. So the, the situation was both similar and very different in terms of the international kind of outlook. Um, I guess I want to come now to uh, the question of the dissolution of the Comintern. Uh, Hapal, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about why the Comintern was dissolved and uh, what we should learn from that. Um, before I come, can I just uh, finish up where, uh, from the previous point? You see, peop the average person who does not understand life and who does not understand the difference between strategy and tactics thinks the communist, uh, communist international like a yo-yo. Today it says we'll have nothing to do with social democrats, they're fascists. Tomorrow they say we, wa we want to have an alliance to fight against fa fascism. It isn't like that. If situation changes, our tactics have to change. Strategy does not change. The strategy is to have, if you like, for the communist uh, uh, international, a world revolution. But the, how to achieve that world revolution will be determined by the situation that takes place. When the uh, revolution was on the upgrade and the social democrats were an obstruction, it was right to denounce them. But when the revolution was not on the upgrade, but the fascists are coming to power in an important country, country like, like, like Germany, highly industrialized, with a huge army, and which had a declared aim of attacking the Soviet Union more than any other country. You had a duty then to change the, ta the tactics. What is more, uh, the Soviet Union under Stalin did its best when the Hitlerites came to power, not only to want uh, a, 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 a alliance with, with, with social democrats, but also with what they called democratic imperialist countries, i.e. non-fascist imperialist countries, to have a united struggle against, uh, you know, have a collective security agree agreement to fight against Germany if Germany should violate any of the signatories, ter 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 territories or the countries they have promised to protect. They wouldn't do that. Soviet Union did everything possible. And then in the end, they gave final proof of their unwillingness to collaborate with the Soviet Union by signing the Munich Agreement in 1938. Now, Soviet Union is constantly being condemned for signing the non-aggression pact with Germany, which is they call either Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact or they call Hitler-Stalin Pact. It's much easier to say these two evil dictators have jo 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 joined hands. It was the, the, the so once that had taken place, it's often referred to as the appease, appe appeasement of Hitler, as though the democratic imperialist countries were weak and they were trying to appease, appease Hitler. No, as Stalin quite rightly said, 
their collective strength is far greater than that of Germany. They actually are the ones who winked at the freeing of Germany from the constraints imposed upon Germany by the Versailles Treaty. They allowed Germany to, to expand its armed forces, its na na naval forces. They uh, occupied the Ruhr. They did every, every, everything possible. American dollars came flooding in to build German industry. And the, when the war actually did start, the Soviet Union went beyond that. But we can come to that in one second. But when that had happened, it was clear that they were all actually trying to direct German aggression towards the Soviet Union. So Soviet Union had to do something to protect itself. And when Germany found itself in a position where on one side was the Soviet Union, on the other side were the Western imperialist countries, it was also looking for a way out. And they were constantly sending messages to Moscow to sign a non-aggression pact. And in the end, when the Western imperialist countries refused to be part of the collective security agreement, in the, I think it was September 19, uh, uh, no, it was in August 19, uh, uh, 39, that the Soviet Union signed the non-aggression aggression pact with, with Germany. The Germans wanted it a treaty of friendship. And Stalin said, no, we can't have it. You've been pouring piles of manure on us for years. We can't suddenly become friends. Non-aggression is fine. We have no intention of committing aggression against Germany. And if you would promise to do the same, that's, that's fine. So Ribbentrop flew to the Kremlin and the seating was such that he was given a seat next to Kaganovich, who was a U Ukrainian Jew. You know, the Hitlerites were killing, it was soon to start killing Jews. You know, they are anti-Semitic anti as well. So the, the pact was signed and Germany felt free now then, and they invaded Poland. And by that time, Western imperialist countries, France and, uh, and Britain particularly, had no choice but to declare war on Germany. And even then, for the first 18 months, there was a phony, phony war. It wasn't a real war because the Western imperialist countries still hoped to direct Hitler's aggression towards Germany. It didn't quite work out like that, particularly after the Soviet victory in the Soviet Finnish war. You know, because that proved the actual ability of the Soviet army to fight in very difficult, 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 difficult conditions. Hitler, re Hitler realized that the way to the Soviet Union through the Baltic was blocked by the Soviet Union. So he started his aggression, uh, you know, first with Poland, the country after country was, was, was taken over, and then eventually France. When they were saying Soviet Union in the war would collapse in six weeks, France collapsed collapsed in five weeks. Its army was supposed to be the strongest on the continent of Europe. It has a line called the Maginot line, which was supposedly impregnable. The Hitlerites made mincemeat of it in a period of five weeks. They drove the British out of the con continent. So if the, if the Soviet Union made any mistakes, which wasn't in its own hands, was that they had calculated that the war of Germany on the continent will last another two years. It didn't because France collapsed so, so, so quickly. All the same, once that had taken place, Hitler then had a choice of either invading Britain or invading the Soviet Union. He made the choice to in invade the Soviet Union through an operation called Operation Bar Barbarossa. And the, what happened after that, you know. But what is happening is that during this period of one uh, war. The imperialist powers that had done so much to act Germany against the Soviet Union, to have a war so that they both be weakened, a rival imperialist power and a socialist power. And Harry Truman, who was the leader of the Cold War, is notorious for having said, if Germany is winning, we should help the Soviet Union. This is before America joined the war. If Soviet Union is winning, we should help, help Germany. In this way, we'll weaken both. But little did he know that they'll have to fight on the side of the, of, the, of the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union during that time not only had a united 
front with social democrats. It had actually a popular front on a world scale with hostile imperialist powers. And it's an example of brilliant tactics. How can you use a pact with hostile imperialist powers to actually defeat their aims? And in the end, although it paid an extremely, exceptionally heavy price, the Soviet Union came out on top, rescued Soviet socialism, brought socialism to half of Eastern and, and, and Central Europe, where the red flag with its hammer and sickle flew proudly over the various capitals uh, of, 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 of the, the, these, these countries. So these were brilliant achievements of Soviet defense capacity as well as of its, of its tactics. And as the English say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I look at the results and see, was the policy correct? It was correct. Had they followed the Trotskyist line, then there would have been no Soviet Union quite early on. It wouldn't be building socialism. It wouldn't be building its industry. You know, Stalin was accused of increasing the tempo of industrialization, that it has produced too much heavy burden on the working class. He spoke to the managers of Soviet business, business industry in 1931. He said, comrades, people are asking us to slow the tempo. We can't. In fact, we must increase the tempo. We are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. In the next 10 years, we close this gap or they crush us. And sure enough, the Soviet Union closed the gap by the time the Nazis invaded and the imperialist powers were unable to crush the Soviet Union. Germany was crushed and many other fascist powers, Italy, etc., were crushed. The Soviet Union survived and was able to face a hostile imperialist world in better shape than ever before, although it had lost so much in terms of material wealth and in terms of human manpower. Their losses were 27 million people, of which 10 million were armed uh, Soviet personnel, and another 17 million who were destroyed by the Nazis who went everywhere, destroying property, enterprises, uh, you know, from collective farms to industrial enterprises, and even killing or stealing a lot of cattle in the, in, in, in the, in the Soviet Union. So that, that, that is really what, what happened. And do you want to talk to us a little bit about the dissolution of the Comintern in this context? The dissolution of the Comintern came in 1943. This is just after the Battle of Stalingrad. So although the tide of the battle, tide of the war has turned, it's not won yet. It will be another two and a half years before Hitler, Hitlerites are defeated, before the Red Army drives the Hitlerites out of the Soviet Union and follows them all the way to, Bel to Berlin and to ra raise the red flag on, on, on the Reichstag while the Fuhrer was committing suicide. It's a wonderful spectacle. And so, so they didn't want this alliance not only to, to disappear, but actually to turn into an alliance with the losing German forces and three of them turn against the Soviet Union. All the time, the attempts of the Soviet Union had been that it should not have to face single-handedly the combined strength of all the imperialist countries. As Lenin said, uneven, uneven development of capitalism has made it possible for the Soviet Republic to survive. The imperialists, had they been united after the October Revolution, would have been able to overwhelm the Soviet Union. They didn't because all the thieves were fighting against each other. That gave the chance to the Soviet Union to survive. So the Soviet Union followed exactly the same policy under Stalin, never to find itself single-handedly fighting the united strength of all the imperialist countries. It was able to, do, able to do that. And after the Second World War, the situation had changed, both in terms of sentiment in favor of the Soviet Union all over the world, Soon after the war, Churchill wanted to start a war against the Soviet Union. His chief of staff told him that it could not be done. It couldn't be done because the Soviet army was too strong to be overwhelmed. And secondly, the sentiment in Western Europe was very pro-Soviet. Soviet Union had saved the world from fascism. It had fought heroically to the admiration and applause of, of the world proletariat and the masses of people all around, around the world. You couldn't start a war. And the only weapon the Americans had to overwhelm the Soviet Union was an atomic weapon. And Truman 
constantly threatened the Soviet Union with an atomic attack. They had actually made plans. They had marked out number of cities in the Soviet Union that were to be the targets of, of, of being subjected to, to, to a, a nuclear attack. And that was one of the reasons, in fact, the main reason that the Americans dropped two nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The, the Japanese were already suing for peace. They couldn't win the war. They were, they were willing to surrender. The Americans dropped the bomb, A, to make sure that the agreement made at Yalta could not be carried out. Under the Yalta agreement, the Soviet Union was to attack Japan on a certain day. So they wanted to preempt it so that they would liberate Japan. Uh, liberate is not the word when Americans come. So that they'll, they'll bring the downfall of the, of the Japanese government on their own without the Soviet Union. And secondly, it was a warning to the Soviet Union, if you don't behave in the coming period like we want you to behave, this is the fate you will face. There will be atomic attack on you. And the Soviet Union intensified its efforts to have its own bomb. And by the 1st of October, when China declares liberation <coughs> of its country, the Soviet Union explodes the first nuclear weapon. These were two nuclear weapons, if you like, the liberation of the Chinese and the Soviet bomb that put an end to American hegemony in the nuclear weapons. They'd never been able to recover that hegemony. All they could do was, you know, extract revenge from people like the Rosenbergs, who had done absolutely nothing for having betrayed uh, Soviets. You know, this is always the story put out. Nobody can develop a technology. If China has got the bomb, it must be that American scientists have given them the information. If the Soviet Union develops it, it must be that the Soviets have uh, received information from the Americans. In fact, the Soviet Union was extremely well advanced in nu nuclear research. Or almost from the beginning of, 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 of the 30s. They would have developed the bomb, but they just intensified their efforts and they produced the bomb and put an end to Ameri Ameri American hegemony. So the Comintern was dissolved in the middle of the Second World War because A, the reason given was the Communist parties have matured now. The old position where they needed guidance from a single organization and be subject to its discipline is no longer. Uh, necessary. Every communist party, which was a member of the communist international, agreed with it. Those days, communists sang from the same hymn sheet. There were no, no differences. But in my mind, there's no question that one of the considerations was not to break the temporary alliance with the so-called democratic imperialist powers. And so that was something that, that could be done away with. But after the war had ended, Another organization was formed called Common Form. Although it was only for information, it actually was much, much more than that. It consulted with, with each other. Of course, not every party could join with it. There were only a dozen or so parties which were mem members of it, but not all the same Common Form did, did exist. So there was an organization. But even if it didn't exist, when the communist movement was united, they could consult with each other. They knew almost by nods and winks what had to be done. You know, our movement is this disintegrated. Every person is a power, you know. Every person is an international by himself. Well, in those circumstances, you cannot achieve, achieve much. But during the time of Stalin, the whole movement sang from the same hymn, hymn sheet. He had that ability and prestige and strength to carry others, others with him not by coercion, but by the force of arguments and by showing to them that that was the right way to do things. And you've pinpointed there, Hapal, uh, one of the many reasons that the bourgeoisie everywhere uh, hate him and vilify his memory still to this day. Uh, Caleb. Sure. Well, um, you know, I, I think there's a, a very interesting article by Mao where he talks about the dissolution of the Comintern and how really the Chinese Communist Party had matured to the point that they didn't need the guidance of the Comintern anymore. They were leading millions of people in the fight against the Japanese invaders and they were liberating territory and, and had an army, a huge army, the Eighth Route Army, uh, and they were doing amazing things and the, they didn't really need the leadership of the Comintern anymore. 
But I will add that um, even up to today, there are organizations that unify communists around the world. Um, and I find, you know, being able to participate with that, those organizations really rewarding. And that's been really important because the left in the United States and in the West is very much, you know, has very much been cultivated by American intelligence to be anti-communist. You know, they have, they've put a lot of foundation money in, and they've really done a lot to manipulate communist organizations. But we have the Women's International Democratic Federation. We have the World Federation of Trade Unions. And we have the World uh, Federation of Democratic Youth and the International Union of Students. Um, and all of those organizations are communist-led international associations, uh, you know, led by the United Nations that, uh, you know, that coordinate not communist parties, but the fields of work that communist parties are involved in, whether it's with women or with students or with the labor movement. Um, and there is the, um, what is it? I believe it's the International Federation of Communist and Workers Parties or the, the seminar. What, what is that called? I can't remember the name of it, but it's, it's, it's a, an organization that, that is also kind of uh, an entity that brings communist groups together. Uh, and you can see communists coming together and, you know, discussing international politics and, and, and coordinating and that, yes, the common turn, uh, the common turns existence uh, in a way, in a way was a little bit of an impediment to, you know, to the unity that was necessary to defeat the fascists, right? There was a law, I believe there's still a law in the United States called the Voris Act uh, that forbids uh, any party in the United States being a member of any international communist body, um, you know? Um, and uh, so it, it's interesting to see this history, but yes, at one point, you know, the world communist movement did uh, march kind of in lockstep and they achieved great things in that process. One thing I did want to add, though, uh, is that during the Second World War, um, you know, there were there were ways that uh, the the anti-fascist United Front was carried out uh, that were contrary to what the common turn wanted. Earl Browder was the leader of the U.S. Communist Party, and he, uh, you know, he complied with Japanese internment uh, and ordered Japanese members of, of the American Communist Party to comply with being interned in, in camps during the war. Uh, he also dissolved the Communist Party and changed it to the Communist Political Association. And people try to blame this on Stalin. But after the Second World War, the Communist Party of the United States waged a huge anti-Browder campaign. And even within the party, uh, William Z. Foster uh, and, and many of the people that were closer with Stalin and the Soviet Union were not approving of what Earl Browder was doing. Uh, Mao Zedong criticized uh, Earl Browder and the World Communist Movement was not approving of Earl Browder's moves. So you can't blame Earl Browder's revisionism and ultimate you know, disillusion of the party during the war. You can't blame that on Stalin. Uh, that was Earl Browder's particular deviation uh, from the Comintern line, which the Comintern, even before the war had ended, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the French magazine, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jacques Duclos wrote an article criticizing Earl Browder and his, his disillusion of the communist party and his revisionism that then the, uh, the world communist movement, the Soviet union circulated this article everywhere, calling out the deviations within the American communist party. So it's really not accurate to, to equate what the American Communist Party was doing and, and blame it on the Soviet Union because, because what Earl Browder did was, was being opposed by the Soviet Union and was repudiated by the Soviet Union. Oh, absolutely. Uh, 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 bad though Bill Browder was, uh, he, he shines almost compared with his son, <laughs> yeah. who, is, who is now an investment banker and, and, and really spearheading the attack on, 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 on Russia and all the rest the rest of it. I just wanted to make a little point there. My um, my mic was muted and I'm an idiot. idiot. Uh, it was just that um, there's a myth that goes around, you know, just like, you know, Stalin's supposed to have controlled like a puppet master every person inside the Soviet Union and killed all the ones who didn't disagree with him personally. Um, there's this idea that the, the Comintern was just the tool of the Soviet party and that it totally controlled, like puppets, everybody everywhere. And Caleb's given us an excellent example of how that wasn't the case. And of course, you know, there, there was an expectation that there would be some discipline having collectively made decisions at the Comintern. That's how communism works. You have debate and then you, uh, you implement decisions that have been taken on the basis of the majority opinion. Um, but we had a, we had not the same problem, but, you know, in Britain, again, there was a struggle inside the Communist Party for understanding of what, how to characterize the war when it broke out initially in 1939, when Britain went to war with Germany, 
um, you know, the Comintern understood and the majority of British communists understood that it was an, at that point, it was an inter-imperialist war, right? But um, Harry Pollitt, who was the leader of the Communist Party of Great Britain, um, wasn't able to give leadership to that line because he, he kind of wasn't convinced by it himself. He had to be replaced for two years. Uh, by I think it was Rajini Palm Dutt. Uh, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong. Who, um, who, who, who's, whose book on the international is very good. I recommend it. Thanks. Yeah. So he had to replace Harry Pollitt for that period when the communists were telling the British working class, this is not your war. This is an imperialist war. And then, of course, once it became an anti-fascist war and the position changed in 1941 because the Soviet Union had been invaded and everybody then had to be mobilized in defense of the Soviet Union and against fascism. Uh, then Harry Pollitt was once more able to to be put back as the leader of the Communist Party. But, you know, that struggle went on and just the fact that the Comintern had laid down a policy and the mass, even the majority of British agreed with it, didn't mean that it was just kind of tamely accepted. A, a struggle went on inside the party as well as internationally. So, so sorry, it's not uh, it's not um, Harry Pollitt's book, it's it's uh, Rajini Palmdath's book that I'm seeing on the international, not Harry yeah. Pollitt's, I'm sorry. No, that's what you said. And I, I'd like to add one more thing, uh, you know, on the 1939 pact, um, it, it's very important to, to note this uh, because now nowadays one of the main foreign policy uh, factions in the United States is called the neoconservatives or the neocons. This is a renegade group of Trotskyites. Uh, basically, in 1939, uh, U.S. media, you know, at the time that that the Soviet Union, you know, was forced to sign this non-aggression pact out of, you know, they needed to protect themselves, and they they signed this non-aggression pact with the Nazis. Um, at the time, U.S. media went into an overdrive equating the Soviet Union with the Nazis. This was their propaganda attack. And, and Time magazine started referring to both the, the Nazis and the, the Communist Party and, and the Soviet Union as commune Nazis. And they said that it was the battle of democracy against commune Nazis. And it was the Soviet Union, their commune Nazis, the Germans, their commune Nazis. And that was their propaganda tactic. And and within the Trotskyites, you know, Trotsky himself didn't go along with this because he aspired to eventually become the leader of the Soviet Union again. He was hoping that he could he could make a deal with Hitler that he could be the leader of the Soviet Union. So he wasn't going to say that. Um, but among the Trotskyites, a number a number of their academics and intellectuals really took this to heart. Um, and Max Schachtman was the leader of them. Uh, and uh, among them was Irving Kristol, who's considered the ideological father of neoconservatism. Um, and many others really argued that somehow the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were the same system. Uh, some argued that it wasn't capitalism or socialism. It was some kind of technocratic society or, or the rule of, uh, the, of managers. And there was a managerial class that had overturned capitalism, but was against the workers also. And this, this thesis that the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany are the same is like the founding belief that these these you know that that, that defines neoconservatism because if you look at Leo Strauss who's one of the main philosophers who you know I mean he, he was the the philosophical mentor of many people in the Bush administration his belief was that uh, if ever the working class starts rallying and getting together that's the equivalent of Nazi Germany uh, that when working people get together and and rally uh, this is somehow going to lead to anti-semitism this leads to the persecution of the intellectuals um, and this is all um, and this is all Nazism and the Soviet Union is an example of, of fascism in practice Nazi Germany is fascism in practice China Cuba they're all fascist um, and and equating equating the two of those is really essential to understanding what the main school dominating US foreign policy and escalating war with Russia etc uh, you know what they believe and uh, the folks who pushed for the US invasion of Iraq they these are former Trotskyites who really took to heart the US government's assertion that somehow the Soviet Union and the Nazis uh, were the same sure certainly interesting to see where Trotskyism leads you in, isn't in, it? in fact in fact most of the terms of abuse against against Stalin were invented by Trotsky even the term Stalinism was invented by Trotsky it's not Stalin never wanted Stalinism. He never said there was such a thing as Stalinist ideology. All his life he claimed to be a pupil of Lenin's, and his main ambition in life was to live up to that position of being the best pupil of Lenin. Yeah. I'd like to say I think he did it. Um, Caleb, I'll come to you um, just to talk a little bit about uh, the role that the communists played in the fight against. Uh, Germany and Japan, uh, and also about um, 
the kind of post-World War II wave of, of liberation struggles and communist role there? Sure. I mean, and just, you know, quickly, because we're, we are running short on time, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think that if you look at the role that the, you know, the Chinese Communist Party played in, in building a fight against the Japanese invaders, um, if you look at what went on in Yugoslavia and elsewhere, it was kind of a tactic, you know, where the communists were always kind of one step ahead in the fight against the fascists. Um, you know, and, and you, uh, the Party of Labor of Albania, uh, their history, their official history talks about how, you know, they formed a national liberation army before the bourgeoisie did. They formed a united, you know, you know, effort and, and democratic liberation front before the bourgeoisie did. Um, and that uh, that by being kind of the main anti-fascist fighters, uh, this was the way that communists were able to turn the fight against fascist invaders, ultimately into a fight against capitalism itself and overturn and, and lead to communists coming to power. And in the aftermath of, of the Second World War, they had the people's democracies. Of, of Eastern Europe, where it was kind of the communists sat at the center of, of all the anti-fascist parties, all the parties that had fought the fascists were kind of unified uh, under the leadership of the communists because they were the most effective anti-fascist fighters. They had the disciplined organizations, they built the militias and the resistance groups and, and coming out of the Second World War, they had kind of utilized the, the fight against fascism to lead ultimately to a fight against all imperialism and all capitalism. Um, and I think that's that's very important to understand. And then that led to after the Second World War, there was a wave of national liberation struggles around the world where communists who had been, you know, been successful in defeating fascism and, and Japan, et cetera, uh, they became the center of the fight against U.S. imperialism. Yeah. Well, yes, I mean, uh, all I can say is, you know, the, the best examples of, of that fight are, are uh, and, uh, Eastern and Central Europe, and of course the whole of the far, far the far far east, you know, from from the Koreans to the to to, to the Chinese to the Viet to the Vietnamese, uh, and in 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 the Chinese people, they all did that. But even after that wave of national liberation had given way to uh, when imperialism realized that they couldn't carry on in the old ways, one country country after another achieved independence. That it formally from and their colonial ma ma masters and the peoples who got um, freed of, of, of direct colonial rule certainly had an option of relying on the socialist bloc for their development. So for a number of years, their development was very much determined by the existence of the, of, of the Soviet Union and, and, and China. I come from India. Now, India is no patch on chi China. But all the same, India has become quite industrialized and a great part in that industrialization was played by, played by the help that it received from the Soviet Union. And in those days, the uh, Indian bourgeoisie could actually have a certain stance, not anti-imperialist, but certainly on various issues was able to exercise independent judgment. Even the pres present fundamentalist government of Modi in India actually, to my pleasant surprise, voted in the United Nations General Assembly to abstain in the resolution condemning Russia's special action in, 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 in Ukraine. And the Americans are very upset. Biden uh, has been trying to, to speak to Modi. They sent this uh, poisonous woman, Victoria Newland, to, 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 to go and, and, and see Modi. Modi, Modi didn't see her. He said he sent his foreign minister to, to, to see her. And only recently, Lavrov visited um, India and he, he saw Modi. So yeah, these are very small things, whether you see Modi or not. Um, but, but they do indicate what the uh, significance is of any particular visit and, and what importance you give to a person, person visiting. So in my view, although 1991 was a big, 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 big set, set, setback. October Revolution continues to guide the affairs of the world, even in our own day. If the very backward ideology of the Afghan Taliban can win against American imperialism, it's in no small part due to the wave of liberation and independent mindedness that was set in motion by the October Re Revolution. They may be anti-communists, but all the same, they, their strength arises from the October Revolution. So we should continue to honor the October Revolution 
we should continue to honor and 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 stand for the achievements of the Soviet Union and other social, socialist countries, China, Vietnam, Cuba, you know, Central and East Euro, Euro, European countries. We should continue to attach importance to their their, their achievements over a, over a period period of time, and that is the strength of the October Revolution. And Stalin, once he was abused by leaders of the opposition, well, that is how it should be, comrades. I don't expect people to 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 to, to sing praises of me when I'm fighting against their wrong policies and leading the Soviet Union in the direction of building socialism. So if Bukharin and Trotsky or Pyotrkov and Radek abuse Stalin, that's no skin of Stalin. Those I don't, uh, you know, no skin of Stalin. I don't think he lost a single day's sleep because these people were his opponents. He had to deal with them. Of course, they were causing much of tr much trouble, and did deal with them with extreme dexterity, not by maneuvering, but by showing them to be wrong and convincing the majority of the membership of the party that their policy was wrong and would lead to disaster. Absolutely. Now, I'm really conscious we've had a very, very long discussion. There's one more point I would like to ask both of you before we wrap up. And it's really this, because, you know, it seems to me uh, that the world movement made more progress when it was possible to coordinate it meaningfully on an international level uh, in the days of the common turn in between the wars. And I would like to ask both of you really what you think it is that stops us doing this today. You know, we do see, you know, and Caleb pointed to some of them, you know, plenty of international conferences and, and organizations which pass all kinds of resolutions. But to be honest, they don't really translate into meaningful action or coordination. It's quite nice to go and meet other communists and sort of find a way to agree with each other internationally. But it's not it's not binding on people. Uh, a lot of the resolutions are just really pieces of paper that express a kind of vague willingness to agree with each other. But when it comes to policy, they're not really meaningfully kind of implemented in their colors. So I'll start with Caleb. Really. Uh, what do you think, Caleb, stops us? Well, I think, unfortunately, and this is a topic for a future podcast, because I really want to hear what, what Comrade Har Harpal has to say about this, because I will learn a, a lot. But I think that a lot of the communist parties around the world are still, they have a lot of the baggage from the Cold War. Uh, the notion of Soviet social imperialism, which was part, you know, put out by China at one point uh, and Albania, you know, that a lot of the communist parties in the world seem to hold on to that. Uh, meanwhile, there is another, a number of communist parties in, in Western Europe. I mean, the Communist Party USA, the French Communist Party that, that seem to hold on to anti-Soviet Euro-communist ideas. And that I think that there's a lot of confusion about what happened in the 20th century. Um, and on that basis, that has, has led to a, a level of ideological confusion where these parties, uh, you know, they, they, they have a hard time agreeing with each other because they don't really see the world in the same way. Um, you know, and I think that, that that's a factor and that ultimately, yes, eventually some kind of new body that is thoroughly anti-imperialist and unifies communists uh, around the world on the basis of being thoroughly anti-imperialist and not having that confusion from from the later Cold War, you know, of Soviet social imperialism, of Euro communism, et cetera. I think some kind of new body will probably eventually be formed as the struggle escalates. But I think that that's probably the primary thing that holds folks back. Propal. I mean, really, forget about joint action. Even to have a joint resolution would be a great step in our present day ex existence. Now you look at the, at the various parties that call themselves communists, and you judge them on what they have to say about Ukraine. Most of them have collapsed in the face of imperialist imp onslaught of imperialist pro propaganda. They either say it's an interim inter imperialist war be between, between uh, uh, Russia and NATO, or simply say Russia has invaded Ukraine. It's got nothing to do with 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 with, with any, any any anybody else. So the, the, there are all sorts of things going. So the basic thing is, really, we got to go back to the basics. A, we must know our Marxism. How many members of communist present-day communist parties actually know Marxism? That's my first point. The second one is that we have actually. Got, got got to not just learn Marxism, but we got to build our own revolutionary parties in our own countries. Internationalism is building a revolutionary party in your own country and fighting against imperialism. And not that opportunists of various countries come to conferences, pass resolutions, pat each other on the back and go home, uh, you know, 
having had good time, you know, it becomes basically an occasion for drinking sessions and go gossip. What we want are working bodies where people actually come to work and do serious work. For example, I very often used to go to the conferences organized by, by Czech, Czech communists uh, in the last few, few years. And at the end of, um, they hold the conference in the morning at about four o'clock or 4.30, they break up for lunch, which really is neither lunch nor breakfast nor dinner, it's just the wrong time anyway. But that's there, so you go there. And one comrade from the Greek KKE, he says, we have to fight against social democracy. So I said, can I ask one question of you? You fight against social democracy, but you only allow participation in these conferences that you hold to people who are so basically social democratic in our country, and you won't let us attend. Can you give an answer? So he went absolutely berserk. And then I met him in, in the middle of Prague. I said, you're arrogant, aren't you? If I'd written a letter to Joseph Stalin, he would take opportunity to answer even in the middle of the Second World War. You don't even acknowledge our, our letters. What's the base, basis for that? You know, and so they are the ones who call every country imperialist, whether it's China, whether it's Russia. So there's an inter-imperialist war going on in U Ukraine. They wash their hands of it. We are not on either side. So it doesn't matter whether NATO countries win or Russia wins. It's all the same, all, all the same to them. So we've got to get the ideology right. We've got to actually, at a certain stage, indulge even in polemics against these people. Often we ignore them, but I think it's time to take the gloves off and actually confront them that what they're propagating is not communism. It's basically rubbish dished out in, 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 in the name of communism. The KKE, having spent their years being crushed by revisionists, have suddenly become ultra Stalinists and put forward policies which actually do not uh, uh, re reflect reality and we got to show what is imperialism and what is an imperialist war and superficially you can always make any country to be an imperialist in fact there's a party in my country which says india is imperialist you know so up to you to, to make up your mind so we we got I, I think the emphasis on building real communist parties in your own country that would create the basis for unity of the communist communist movement for the moment, we don't have that. In most of the West European countries, there is literally not a communist party worth speaking about. And we have a party, CPG, BML in Britain. I think it's the best party of the working class in Britain. But for the moment, we're so small and so isolated from the working class, the working class doesn't know we exist. So we got to actually reach the working class, not by compromising our principles, but by explaining our principles as comprehensively and in as comprehensible terms as is, as is possible. But we must take the message. We won't make any progress by hiding that message and by not taking the message. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, I guess I will just add that um, that I think, you know, what you're, what you're getting at with the, with the Greek Communist Party and others, and I, I see this a lot, is that even among people that are politically better than the, the Communist Party USA or the Communist Party of Britain, there's this weird belief that somehow if a party is the remnant of what was officially the common turn party, that makes it somehow good, right? That make that, that gives it some kind of blessing. And that's simply not true. You know, the second international, uh, if Frederick Engels and Marx and others were a big influence on it, but look what it turned into, right? And that just because some group, you know, is the remnant of what it once was, doesn't make it the holy, the holy eternal group. And that, uh, that, you know, that, that, you know, you have to remember that there are many examples of, you know, the Cuban revolution, if, if they had, you know, the Cuban Communist Party was revisionist, uh, the, the Popular Socialist Party, and Raul Castro broke discipline uh, to work with Fidel to carry out the Cuban revolution. Um, and that there are many examples around the world with, with you know, we see Bolivarianism and their, and, and, and their rise and that, that there is revolutionary energy outside of, of bona fide communist parties. Uh, and there is also um, there is also at the same time, there is stagnation within, you know, existing communist parties that do have the mantle of being at one point the common turn 
you know, you know, affiliate. So um, I think that, yeah, you know, getting beyond that belief that just because once something used to be the common turn affiliate, it's eternally, eternally good. I think that that's, a, that's an illusion that people fall into. I mean, I could definitely wax lyrical on this topic for quite a long time, but I'm not going to test our listeners' patience anymore. I feel like at some point in the future, we should possibly come back to what on earth happened to the international movement, uh, that it's gone so terribly wrong. And Ukraine is, is, a, is a litmus test, isn't it? I mean, there have been tests before, but right now, my gosh, the degeneration has become so endemic across the world. There's hardly a party whose line you can look at and say, yes, they've understood what's happening. And it's precisely as Kapal said, because they gave up on studying and trying to understand Marxism years ago. What they actually do now is in the name of Marx, in the name of Lenin, they just spout all kinds of you know, bourgeois prejudice and mislead the working class while they do it. And they're not able to stand up to the onslaught of bourgeois propaganda precisely because they don't understand Marxism. It's the power of Marxism that enables people like us who represent, as Paul said, tiny forces, actually, to withstand all this propaganda quite, quite happily. You know, I don't feel overwhelmed by the bourgeois propaganda that overwhelms much bigger parties because I'm confident in my Marxism, because that's what we do. We train our people to study and understand so they can make sense of the world and the class struggle and wage the class struggle. Ultimately, we hope successfully. Uh, I'm going to leave it there with everybody. Thank you very much to both of you. It's been a very long, but I think a very useful and interesting conversation. And I look forward to seeing you all next time.